Welcome to Our Hope, a production of Chosen People Ministries. On this podcast, you will hear inspiring testimonies, learn about messianic apologetics, and discover God's plan for Israel and you. Wherever you're listening, we hope you lean in, listen closely, and be blessed. Who is Jesus? The possible answers are about as different as the individuals who suggest them. Was he a prophet? A revolutionary? A well-meaning but misguided martyr? The New Testament's central claim about Jesus is that he is the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, and Savior of the world. Part of this portrait is that Jesus is fully man and fully God. Many people find this concept strange and illogical. How can someone be both human and God? Traditional Jewish people object to this idea, often claiming that it is idolatry or suggests a person can be God. Many others simply see it as a contradiction, much too illogical for modern people to believe. However, this teaching that Jesus is God become man without ceasing to be God is essential for redemption. To help us navigate this complex and important topic, we invited back Brian Crawford, He recently earned his Doctor of Ministry degree from Talbot School of Theology, where his final project was on philosophical objections to the Incarnation. Brian has been part of Chosen People Ministries for 13 years and oversees our digital evangelism and apologetics team. Brian, you've been on Our Hope multiple times. Welcome back to Our Hope. Thanks so much, Nicole. Great to be with you. Great to see you again. We know you're very busy, so we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this very important topic today. Yeah, great great to be with you and to talk about this particular topic because it is near and dear to my heart, my ministry, my studies. It, it just encapsulates so, so many topics at the same time. Definitely. And speaking of your ministry and your studies, we also know that you're an adjunct professor now and you have an apologetics website called Chosen People Answers. And you're probably writing a book right now, I imagine. So what are some of your hobbies? What do you do for fun? Well, uh, it's kind of fun that a lo- I have a lot of hobbies and I get to do a lot of them in various aspects of ministry. Uh, probably the, my biggest hobby is uh, photography and uh, closely, closely associated with that is videography. But um, I also am a PC gamer. Uh, I like hiking and soccer, uh, but pretty much anything that's on the cutting edge of technology, I, I want to be there. So like, for instance... In the last few months, I've ha- had a lot of fun with uh, these new AI tools that have been coming out, and I've had a lot of fun oh, yeah. creating uh, funny images with my little kids. They they wanted me to make uh, a picture of Darth Vader fighting hamsters, and boy, did the AI <laughs> make some awesome pictures of that. That is amazing. Well, we want to see those when we're done recording. So <laughs> Sounds let good. you know. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, what other projects are you working on right now? Um, We know that you lead Chosen People Answers. Is there anything new that your team is working on? Yeah. So Chosen People Answers is a is a huge multi-year project that is really the main thing that I work on, which is uh, providing answers to the major objections that Jewish people have about believing in Jesus. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not a project that just you you finish and then you're done. It's a constant research and writing and also developing some pretty cutting edge apologetics websites uh, for that project. So that yeah. that's what I'm working on most of the time. But then I also work on uh, a website called aboutmessiah.com, which is yeah. uh, for Jewish seekers, people who are more curious about who uh, Jesus, Yeshua is. And those articles tend to be a lot shorter and um, more, more uh, accessible um, and mm. we're, we're hoping to expand to doing more media like a, a YouTube channel or whatnot down the future. But, um, th- those two websites take up uh, most of my, my time in ministry. That's awesome. We really appreciate what your, uh, team does because our ministry as a whole is very niche, but your team is kind of like a niche within a niche. So you definitely fill a void there. Um, and I bet on your website, you probably get questions about the incarnation. So let's jump into today's topic. 
most people today would not object to the idea that Yeshua is human. I, I would say even a lot of Jewish people would say that Jesus was at least a human being who walked on the earth. However, we can grow so accustomed to this idea that we miss its importance. So why is it still important to acknowledge that Yeshua is a human being? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And the most basic answer is that, well, Scripture teaches it, so we should believe it. Uh, we shouldn't mm-hmm. just ignore that Scripture says that, that he's a man. So for the most, right. most basic reason is that to be faithful to Scripture, we need to affirm Yeshua's full divinity. Um, but there's there's deeper reasons why we should affirm it. And uh, it really comes down to the means of our salvation. Uh, right. If Yeshua did not have a full humanity, then we cannot have a full salvation. That's really what it comes down to. And I, I think one of the most important verses that, that teaches this is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. And I'll I'll read it here. Um, the author of Hebrews says, Therefore he, Yeshua, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation or atonement for the sins of the people. So this verse is saying that our our atonement, our propitiation for our sins, is actually dependent on Yeshua being made like us in every respect. And so that means that he needs to have a full humanity with a body and a soul and a human mind and emotions and a human will, because if he didn't have those things, like we have those things, then those parts of us can't actually be saved. That's a very interesting way to put it. I, I haven't really thought about it that way before. So he had to be us in order to save us and walk among us too. And everything we know about Jesus comes from scripture. So what are some examples of how the gospels depict Jesus as a human? It, yeah, it's really from, from beginning to end, it depicts him as, as a human being uh, in, his, in his incarnation, at least when he was born out of Mary's womb. And so being, being born, having a human birth is actually uh, one of the first ways that we see that he's a human. He didn't just pop mm-hmm. into an existence. Uh, kind of like Adam was created just as a full man. No, he he was born like each of us are born. Um, and then he went through the full uh, childhood development. Uh, he grew and became strong. And Luke says that he increased in wisdom and maturity. And uh, so he had a childhood experience like every human being has a childhood experience. Mm-hmm. And um, that means that in his human nature, he had limited knowledge. He he had to grow in wisdom. Now, how how does that fit with his divine nature? Well, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in his human nature, he was limited in his in his um, in his wisdom as a human being. Um, it also says that he was limited in other ways that we as humans are are limited. Uh, scripture says that he became tired. Uh, mm-hmm. That he was thirsty and hungry, um, he he needed he needed emotional and spiritual and medical support. Like when he was out in the desert for forty days, it actually says that the angels ministered to him. Yeah. Um, he lost strength. Uh, he he said that his soul was troubled, which means one that he has a soul, and second, his soul can be troubled, just like we can be troubled. And probably the, the the final way is that he he died. I mean, he was he did not escape uh, the the human death that each of us uh, will one day go through unless the Lord returns before. So in in this full range of experiences, the the gospels portray Jesus as fully human. That's right, and the gospels also make it clear that. Jesus is Jewish. He was born in Bethlehem and he lived in Israel and his disciples were Jewish. And this is one of the key truths in the New Testament. And in Matthew 1, 1, it says, this is the very first verse of the New Testament. It describes him as the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why is it important that we get that verse in there? So again, I'll I'll speak from a more simple perspective that simply Jesus 
the Messiah needed to be the son of David, the son of Abraham, to fulfill biblical prophecy that the Messiah would come from Abraham's line and David's line. So uh, we, we, we need to have that for him to be the Messiah. But I think all too often that lineage is explained as a historical fulfillment that happened way in the past. And it, it doesn't have much relevance to our understanding of Jesus today. But again, if Jesus was fully human, that means his humanity continues today. Like you and I are going to be human for eternity. Um, mm-hmm. And that means that Jesus' humanity continues but that also means that his Jewishness continues today. Uh, We shouldn't say that Jesus was a Jew, but rather that he is a Jew. Uh, The the king of the universe is a Jewish man who is also the son of God. And that means that the son of God will forever experience a human life. Yes, through human eyes, but those eyes are actually Jewish eyes. And so I don't think that we should abstract the concept too much, you know, turning Jesus into this abstract human. Um, Mm -hmm. He is fully human, sharing our humanity, whether no matter what our background is. But he's also particularly a Jewish man. And this means that this is an eternal affirmation of God's love for the Jewish people and his faithfulness to his covenants. And it should forever get rid of any idea that God hates the Jewish people, is opposed to the Jewish people. No, (laughs) uh, he can't oppose himself. Uh, Yeshua the Messiah is a Jewish man. And one thing I love about this verse is that It shows us, like you said, that God is faithful to his covenants because his covenant to Abraham was unconditional. And I think even to David as well. And so it was not contingent on anybody's perfection or anybody's ability to be good. Um, We know that Abraham and David were both flawed people, but God was still going to keep those promises that, yes, there was going to be a king who was going to rule on David's throne forever. And it was going to be a descendant of Abraham who was going to bless all the nations. And so, yeah, he's the king of the world, but he's also the king of Israel. So it's pretty cool. So now that we've discussed Yeshua's humanity, let's talk about his deity. Um, Yeshua's deity is one of the most difficult to grasp and difficult to believe theological truths. This is especially true among Jewish people. What are the most common objections you hear from this community specifically about the deity of Yeshua? Yeah, we could be talking about this for for quite some time. I'll I'll try mm-hmm. to try to keep it brief. Um, probably the most common objection is something that I call proof texting. Um, mm-hmm. It's when a Jewish person quotes a verse and thinks that it obviously disproves the idea that Jesus could be could be God, and yeah. um, it oftentimes. No, I would say always, it does not actually mean that, but it, it is oftentimes assumed to mean that verses in the Torah mean that Jesus cannot be God. And there's there's two that I want to highlight. Uh, the most common ones are uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and also Numbers chapter 12. Mm-hmm. Um, Deuteronomy 4 says that you shall not worship idols um, or any created things because, and this is the reason why, because Israel saw no form on Sinai. So this is oftentimes uh, uh, cited as saying that you saw no form on Sinai because God cannot be in a form. And Jesus Mm -hmm. has a physical form. Therefore, he can't be God because God has no form. And um, so that is oftentimes cited as, you know, just an easy slam dunk against anything that has a form being God. But if you if you read that passage, it doesn't actually say that God cannot come into a physical appearance. Um, right. It just says that when Israel experienced God at Mount Sinai, Israel saw no form. Mm-hmm. But there's other passages in the Torah 
where it actually says that God did show up in physical form and Moses and the elders saw God's form. And so just because the whole nation didn't see God in a form, that doesn't mean that God cannot come into a form. And I'll I'll just uh, uh, cite uh, Numbers uh, 23, 19, where it says that Moses saw the form of the Lord. It uses the same Hebrew word um, as in Deuteronomy. And then Exodus 24, where it says that Moses and the elders saw the God of Israel and saw something under his feet. So, hmm. so God can take on physical form. Um, and so that we can't, we can't say that simply because, you know, Jesus has a physical form that he can't be God. Um, but I do want to clarify that God doesn't have an eternal body. He, he is not a physical thing. He is spiritual. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean that he can't come into physical form uh, temporarily. And uh, so that that proof texting doesn't work. Um, uh, another one is uh, in Numbers 12, where it says God is not a man that he should lie. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree that God in his eternal divine nature, he is not a man. He, he, he cannot lie. He does not lie. He's not fickle. He's not limited. He's not finite. Uh, His eternal nature is not not a man. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that God could not take on the form and the nature of a man. Uh, I don't believe that, that Jesus is only a man. I believe that he is a man and divine at the same time. So that 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 verse doesn't really work. So those are probably the most common proof texting um, varieties that um, that I've heard. Um, but there are many other common objections in the Jewish community that are more advanced, and we would probably need a, several more podcasts to really <laughs> really get into yeah. it. But just real briefly, the two biggest objections in the Jewish community. Um, come from uh, Maimonides, the 12th century Jewish philosopher, and also from uh, Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism. And Maimonides basically taught that it's a logical contradiction for God to have any kind of relationship with physicality, with any kind of physical presence. Um, And so he, he takes a more rational, logical contradiction kind of way of saying that it's impossible for anything physical to have any relationship with God. But then Jewish mysticism, it it has a completely different objection. It basically says that the entire universe is God's body. And so we all are divine. We we have the divine sparks within us. And so who, who cares if we're claiming that Jesus is divine because everything is divine. Uh, rocks and trees and people and the sun, moon, and stars, they're all divine too. So they kind of uh, object to Jesus's divinity by saying, who cares? Everything is divine. And so uh, this is, these are the two tracks that I really followed in my, in my dissertation writing, really handling these more advanced Jewish objections that maybe we can discuss on another podcast. Definitely. Well, I do have a question now that you brought up those passages. Um, a lot of people have said that any time you see God take a form in the Old Testament, it's always Jesus. Is that true? Uh, yes, I, I actually believe that is the case. Um, yeah. I believe that uh, the New Testament says that God the Father uh, was never seen or heard uh, by mm-hmm. Israel. Um, Jesus said that to his um, Jewish audience and um Paul says that uh, the Father is invisible. He dwells in unapproachable light. Um, so I believe that um, whenever whenever God spoke in the, the Hebrew Scriptures, or whenever God showed up in physical form in the Hebrew Scriptures, it was always God the Son. Because God mm-hmm. the Son is the appointed mediator between the Father and the universe. And so... Um, he he has the role of of speaking to us as the word of god and then the word of god was made flesh and that's that's who yeshua is that's awesome now thinking about this i once saw a cartoon online 
And it was actually made by a Muslim. But it basically has, you know, in the panels, you see a picture of Jesus. And it takes scripture verses out of context. And it's basically Jesus saying, I never said to worship me. I never said I was God. I never said I had deity. (laughs) And we know if we read these verses in context, or also if we just read the rest of the Gospels, we know that Yeshua does claim that he has divinity. So did Yeshua himself even claim to be God? Yes, over and over and over again, but just not in the way that some people in the 21st century expect or want him to claim to be God. So we need to take ourselves back to the first century. Uh, we're, we're talking about Jesus as a first century Jewish man speaking with fellow first century Jewish people. And did they interpret Jesus as claiming deity? Yes, that's why they picked up stones to stone him. That's why they put him on trial saying that he was blaspheming. Uh, so it was very clear to first century Jewish people what Jesus was claiming. I just, it, 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 it really frustrates me when I hear people in the 21st century that say, oh, he never claimed to be God because he didn't say the words, I am God. Well, he didn't need to because he said it in so many other ways. So yeah. how about I give you some, some concrete examples? Um, yeah. probably the most, uh, explicit affirmation that Jesus made of his deity is in John 8, 58, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you just listen to that in English, it makes no grammatical sense. It it should be before Abraham was, I was, was. but it's in the present tense. So, so even, even, even in English, it tips you off to him saying something odd. But the I am there, it's not just some present tense oddity. It is actually the Greek form of the Hebrew name of God. So he was actually claiming the name of God there, saying that he preexisted Abraham because he is Hashem. He is the name. He is the Tetragrammaton. And so mm-hmm. that's that's probably the clearest, but there's there's many other other uh, claims uh, of his deity in, in the scriptures. Um, I like highlighting how Yeshua accepted the titles of Theos and Kurios, which in English are God and Lord, uh, and these are titles that in first century Judaism were only given to the God of Israel, and yeah. yet. People in Yeshua's circle, they called him these titles, and he never corrected them. Um, But then you could say, well, okay, and then maybe just the people around him were were confused. Well, you you can't go that direction. Uh, Jesus' most common title for himself uh, was the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. Now, some people who don't really know the Jewish background of that phrase— think that that is just him claiming his humanity. But most scholars today would say that that's actually him claiming his divinity because of the connection of that phrase with Daniel chapter 7, with this son of man who has the exclusive right to be ushered into the presence of of God the Father in heaven. And so Uh Yeshua claiming that title for himself is... uh, is, is, is claiming something that is exclusively uh, divine. Um, and I think that Yeshua also claims his divinity by claiming attributes that only God has. Uh, yeah. For instance, he said, no one knows the Father except the Son. Well, if the Father is infinite and he's unfathomable and he's beyond us, his, his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And yet only the Son, only himself, knows the Father, that implies a, an infinite omniscience. Of his, his knowledge is far beyond ours. And so that is something that uh, we, can only, um, we can only attribute to uh, his divine nature. And uh, lastly, he claimed to have uh, the ability uh, to be omnipresent. Uh, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, um, in Matthew yeah. 28. And 
And he also said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Well, mm-hmm. who, who can say that? Not even angels can say that. Uh, um, the only way that God, that, that a, a, a person could be with people in multiple places all over the world is if they're omnipresent, if they have the, the, the attribute that only God does. So, so Yeshua claimed he was God in a very Jewish way. He demonstrated that he was God. He accepted worship as God. And he uh, claimed to have attributes that only God has. Shalom, friends. I'm Mitch Glazer, president of Chosen People Ministries. We recently purchased a beautiful property in Tel Aviv that will serve as a new messianic center with a vision to create a warm, friendly space for Israelis to fellowship and ask questions about the Messiah. So this December, we'd love to have you join us as we dedicate the building right during the festival of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication and the entire country is all lit up because there are menorahs everywhere. It reminds us of Jesus, Yeshua, the light of the world, and it's our prayer that this Messianic Center will reflect His light to the people of Israel. There'll be opportunities to walk where Jesus walked, engage in our worship nights, pray over the new center, meet our workers on the ground, and so much more. So please join us. Spots are limited, very limited, but we hope to see you there. So register as soon as you can. To learn more or to sign up today, visit chosenpeople.com slash radio. That's chosenpeople.com slash radio. So Brian, did Yeshua's earliest followers think that he was God? Like, how do we know this is not a concept that was added later on? Sure. Yeah, we we have a lot of evidence that Yeshua's earliest followers uh, believed in his uh, divinity. And uh, we can get that not only from uh, the New Testament itself, which is a set of first century Jewish documents. Um, We can also get that from the earliest Jewish and Christian documents written about Jesus in the late first century and the early second century. Um, all of them seemed to affirm uh, his divinity. Um, actually, in the second century, the uh, the divinity of Jesus was not the thing that was most controversial. It was actually his humanity. There mm-hmm. were a lot of, of heretical groups in the second century that affirmed that Jesus was divine. Uh, they had problems saying that he actually had a physical human body. They would deny that. They would say that he was just a, a just a spirit or an apparition or just a vision that the apostles had. And so oh, one wow. of the earliest uh, uh, things that the, that the Messianic believers in the church had to fight against was actually affirming that Jesus was fully human uh, and mm-hmm. divine at the same time. So there's a lot of passages in the New Testament that affirm uh, Jesus's divinity in the eyes of the uh, the apostles. Um, you know, the classic one is John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And, uh, that word is identified as Yeshua. And, uh, and Paul says he is before all things, uh, all things, uh, he's before physical things. He is before the universe. He's before time. He existed before time. Uh, you can only exist before time uh, because time is a created thing. You can only exist before time if you are timeless. And you can only be timeless if you are God. So you can see the logic here that that um, these, these are ways that the apostles are trying to explain that, that Yeshua is divine. Uh, Paul says that Messiah is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. His, he, he is omniscient. Uh, Peter said the same thing in John 21 when he said to Jesus, Lord, 
that's a divine term. Lord, you yeah. know all things. Mm -hmm. So we see, we see that the apostles, they affirmed his divinity, they affirmed his omniscience, they affirmed his eternality. And, and these are things that, that only God has as, as uh, abilities or attributes. Um, but I, I would love, love our listeners to uh, be aware of um, a, a Christian scholar who just passed away just a, just a few years ago. He's one of my favorites. His name is Larry Hurtado. Mm -hmm. And Larry Hurtado really uh, went in depth in his scholarly career in explaining how the earliest believers in Jesus that we have on record they really did believe in Jesus's divinity. It wasn't this evolution in the church, uh, like over time. It was yeah. there right from the beginning. And he points to seven different aspects of early Christian worship that wow. implies that Jesus is divine. This is before the creeds. This is before people were writing about what we should believe about Jesus' divinity, they were actually implying his divinity through their worship of him. And so the, mm -hmm. the seven things are, are as follows. First, the early believers, they prayed to Jesus. You are yeah. not supposed to pray to anything or anyone who is not God. That is absolute blasphemy to pray to anything else. But they prayed to Jesus. Uh, secondly, they uh, had invocations and confessions of Jesus' name. They asked Jesus to help them. They confessed Jesus' name as, as, as a divine name. Uh, again, you don't do that unless Jesus is, is divine. Uh, they baptized in Jesus' name. Now, baptism didn't come from the New Testament. Baptism is ritual washing that came from Leviticus. And yet they were associating these ritual washings with Jesus. You shouldn't do that unless Jesus is the one who actually, as the word of God, commanded Leviticus. Uh, number four, they had ritual celebrations of the Lord's Supper. So they included a religious practice named after the Lord, which again is a Jewish way of saying the name of God, and they called it, after, they referred to Jesus in, in that. Uh, number five, they sung hymns to Jesus. You're not supposed to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to anyone except for God, and yet mm -hmm. they were singing hymns to, to Jesus. They prophesied in the name of Jesus. Well, nobody is supposed to be giving prophecy except for God, uh, and yet he is the one who is referred to as the origin of the prophecy. And then uh, finally, number seven, there's this scribal practice. So scribes would write down the scriptures and uh, they would do this practice of abbreviating Jesus's name in the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, not writing it out fully. And mm -hmm. this is something that was widely attested with Hebrew scribes not writing the full name of God in Hebrew, but then these early, early scribes of the Greek New Testament, they started doing the same thing with Jesus's name, which is, again, tying his identity, his name with divinity and not writing it out in full because they didn't want to be disrespectful uh, to his name. And so all of these seven practices uh, and these these worship practices they imply that Jesus is divine. We see this in the early in the in the first century. We see this in the early second century. Uh, it, it it was there right from the beginning. That's amazing. I didn't know anything about early church practices. I mean, some of those have still obviously persisted to today. But the fact that they were doing it that long ago is uh, it's amazing, and it's still here today. So yes. thank God for that. Yes, and it really does cut through those more skeptical modern theories that, oh, you know, people didn't believe in Jesus' divinity until, you know, like the third and the fourth century, the Council of Nicaea, that's when they decided that Jesus was God. No, no, no mm -hmm. none of that holds water historically. Yeah. So what you were saying about the, the first century, like heresies, um, is that what, John was referring to in his letter when he said that 
uh, I don't know if he said false prophets or antichrist, anybody who claims that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Is that what he was referring to? Yeah, uh, I think that he was referring to a early form of Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism Mm -hmm. denied that uh, the physical body uh, had any goodness within it. Uh, Physicality was actually evil. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that John was seeing these these trends uh, uh, infiltrate uh, the, the, the early church. And he, as an eyewitness of Jesus's body, and as knowing that the body is is created by God and is going to be resurrected and it's a good thing, uh, he he fought against that early heresy, and uh, yeah, that is that is why we need to make sure that we uh, are not being influenced by outside ideas when we are considering uh, who Jesus is, uh, because nothing in Scripture uh, would lead us to say that. Uh, Jesus was not human or that his humanity was evil or he needed to escape from his body. Which I think is also a good reminder. It When I think about the fact that Jesus became human, it kind of shows that God did not regret creating humanity and that he's not ashamed of us. Would you say that's true? Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah. When he created his creation, including its physicality, uh, he said, it is tov meod. It is very good. And if you are going to say that the very physical universe that God created is evil, then you're going to deny that passage in Genesis and question why God made physical things. No, uh, the physicality of the universe, our very bodies, they were made by God, designed by God. The only thing that's wrong with them is the, the brokenness that has come through the fall. But that's why that's why Messiah was sent was to fix what has been broken, so that we can have that kind of physical uh, experience with God that He designed us to have in the garden. Going back to Yeshua's deity, what do we mean when we talk about His deity or say that He is God? Is He the God of Israel? Yes, there is only one God. We can continue to affirm the Shema that uh, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and Yeshua is God, the same God who spoke to Israel, the same God who wrestled with Jacob, the same God who Mm. uh, was one of the three visitors who spoke to Abraham. Uh, He is the the same God. Now, how can you, how can we say that? Because, well, God is not just in one place at one time. Yeah, this is, this is, it gets complicated. It gets difficult yeah. uh, to understand <laughs> the, what God's oneness means uh, with, with Yeshua or with God the Son as the Son of God. And so that's where we get into the triunity or the trinity of who God is. And that's that admittedly difficult subject to understand. And yeah. Maybe we can dive into that more. And uh, again, have me back for another podcast. Most direct answer to your question is, is, is he the God of Israel? Uh, can be answered in the New Testament book of Jude. Uh, very short yeah. book. Jude was Jesus' brother. And uh, Jude verses 4 and 5 say that Jesus in his pre-incarnate state, meaning before he was born by Mary, as the son of God, he was actually the one who was present with Israel during the Exodus. And he was the one who spoke to them. He was the one who judged them in the desert. It says that that was Jesus, the the son of God. And uh, that opens up a whole lot of possibilities because this is, this is where I get the idea that whenever Israel interacted with God in the Hebrew scriptures, it seems that Jude is saying that that was the Son of God, Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. And so that that is fruit for a lot of uh, re-looking at the Hebrew Bible. Oh, definitely. And I think that bridges the gap for believers who who say that God is so nice in the New Testament and so mean in the Old Testament. They well, look at Jude, you know, it's the same God. And we know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. As well. And uh, he he came first as the the lamb who uh, 
died for the sins of the world. But uh, oh, he he still has that lion in him. He he is coming <laughs> back. Uh, how how people can say that Jesus is meek and mild and would never harm a flea? Uh, have you read Revelation? Uh, have have mm. you read about him coming on the, the the white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth? Uh, yeah, that is the same Jesus who came two thousand years ago. Oof, definitely. So, speaking of the God of Israel and the Lion of Judah, do the Hebrew scriptures ever suggest or even allow that the Messiah would be divine? Yes, of, of course. Uh, we see probably the clearest um, passage on this um, in Isaiah 9-6. Now, when I say clear, I need to speak from a believing perspective. It's clear to us as believers. It's it's hard for our our unbelieving Jewish friends to read this passage and see it, but oftentimes they they read this passage and they say, how was this hiding from me? Uh, my whole life, because yeah. in in Isaiah nine six or nine five in the Jewish numbering system, uh, it says that uh, a man coming from David's line, who's going to sit on David's throne, he's going to be born as a child. He's going to be a son, <laughs> and his name is going to be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, mm-hmm. how can this child? be named with these these titles. Um, yeah. See, many times uh, uh, Jewish boys are named after God's attributes. You know, mm-hmm. God is mighty. God is God is God is my salvation. Um, uh, but it's always a description of who God is. Mm-hmm. But in this verse, it seems like it's actually a description of the Son Himself. That the son himself has the right to be called these titles in Hebrew. And so uh, if that's the case, then this son who is going to be born from David's line, he's, he's going to be divine. And uh, I, I also like pointing out uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, this great passage about the Messiah's uh, atonement and redemption of sinners like you and me. Uh, there actually is, I believe, uh, an implied divine claim. Um, in Isaiah 53, verse 12, uh, it says that this servant, who we as believers identify as the Messiah, this servant will bear the sin of many and make mm-hmm. intercession for the transgressors. Now, I've, I've done a study on uh, that idea of bearing sin, of of uh, of taking sins away from a person and f- placing it somewhere else. That's actually the idea of forgiveness in Scripture. It's actually bearing God bears our sins, or the Levitical priest he he lifts our sins from our shoulders and he he takes them to God. There there is only one who actually can remove our sins from us. The Levitical priests they only transferred the sins from human beings to animals, and then God considered those animals to then transfer those sins onto God, where God is the one who is forgiving. Really, God is the only one who can forgive sins. And that's what the Pharisees said to Jesus. You know, who can forgive sins but God alone? I agree with that. Only God can forgive sins. And yet, it says here in Isaiah 53, verse 12, that the servant himself is going to bear those sins, and he is going to bring forgiveness to people himself. And I read that as a claim to the servant's divinity, because no one can forgive sins but God alone. Amen. And and that was only two messianic prophecies. There's a ton more in the Old Testament. Uh, so just a quick plug, we do have the Moody Handbook for Messianic Prophecy in our online store, store.chosenpeople.com. But yes, crazy stuff, so much in just two prophecies. And speaking of these prophecies, Brian, we know that you're on our ministry staff. Do you have any particular story of discussing this topic with a pre-believing Jewish person? Yeah, just recently I was uh, preaching about these topics at a 
at a local Messianic congregation. And I, I had two Jewish men come up to me. Uh, one, one had been a believer for years, and the other one was still still processing who Yeshua is. And, and the first one said to me after I was explaining uh, uh, the, the Messiah in the Tanakh and the triunity of God in the, in the Tanakh, uh, he said, thank you, Brian, because I had no clarity on this. I, I, I knew it from the New Testament. I, I had no way of knowing that these things were true in, in the Jewish Hebrew scriptures. And so that was, that was a real affirmation. But the, but the other man who hasn't yet come to, to faith in Yeshua, um, he, he had a lot of really good questions. And he was coming from that more Mamonidean perspective that, well, God can't have uh, physical, uh, uh, any relationship with physical space. But then he saw me bringing up these passages and seeing that, whoa, well, maybe, maybe Maimonides was wrong about this. Maybe these aren't just metaphors. Maybe God can actually have some kind of physical presence in our midst. And I said, yeah, you need to keep praying about this, keep studying, keep reading, because Yes, God has shown up in Israel's history, and Yeshua, the Messiah, is the culmination of God showing himself to Israel. Yes. And really, nothing is too difficult for him, so he can definitely show up as a man if he wants to. (laughs) So, Brian, why was it necessary that the Messiah be both human and God? And how can one person be both? Yeah, uh, that's the million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> this is, th- these are difficult concepts and I'll, I'll try to break it down. Um, why was it necessary? Well, um, it's necessary for Messiah to be human uh, because, uh, like I mentioned before, if he is going to save us, fully and restore us fully, then he needs to be human because what is what he needs to conform us to the image of God, which we have had uh, marred since the fall. We, we have, we are made in the image of God, but that, that image of God in us has been broken. It's been tarnished because of our sin. Uh, we, we are the pinnacle of God's creation, but we are also the pinnacle of uh, coming up with new ways to sin. And in order for us to be repaired, uh, we needed to have our broken human nature to be restored to perfect human nature. But there is no perfect human nature unless God becomes a man and lives a human life unstained by sin and then he can serve as the model by which we can be repaired. So we needed Messiah to come and uh, live the perfect human life to to uh, be able to uh, conform us to his image. But he also needed to be God because no human being has the power to resist sin unless, mm-hmm. unless he's also God. And yeah. no human being has the power to forgive our sins unless he's also God. And so he needed to have the infinite power that only God has in order uh, to save us from our sins. And I, I could I could go on uh, on that, but th- those are probably the, the biggest reasons why he needed to be both God and man at the same time. But how he can be God and man at the same time, that's, that's a whole different <laughs> uh, question. And yeah. I spent yeah. a lot of time in my dissertation trying to help help my readers understand the rationality of believing that because it's oftentimes claimed and especially in the Jewish world that it's totally irrational to believe that a man can be God that God can be a man because God is not a man and a man is not God it's like a fundamental contradiction in their minds well um real briefly um we don't believe that Yeshua uh, had his humanity mixed with his divinity, mm-hmm. meaning that he is some kind of combination of humanity and divinity. 
Uh, no, uh, we believe that he is human fully and he is God fully and his mm-hmm. two natures don't spill over into each other, meaning that he is finite according to his human nature, but he's infinite according to his divine nature. But in some mysterious way, he's both at the same time. And this is where I would I would push back and I would say it's not irrational to believe that. It's just beyond our rationality. And we need to affirm that there are many things about who God is that are beyond our ability to understand. Uh, we're finite. We cannot understand the infinite. We can't understand how God knows all things, that he exists in past, present, and future all at the same time. Uh, we we just have no ability. It makes our, it makes our minds explode. Uh, but yeah. there's one analogy that I like bringing up that is even in the physical universe that can kind of help us wrap our minds around this. And and it's the, the nature of light. Uh, we all know what light is. Light works. We, we can turn on the, uh, the, the switch and it works. Uh, the, the sun goes up and the light works. We know that light actually works, but we actually don't know how. Mm-hmm. Uh, when scientists actually try to figure out what light is and how it works, uh, we're actually pretty confused still to this day yeah. with all of our scientific advances. Because if you study light using one set of instruments, it looks like light is a particle. Mm-hmm. It's actually a physical thing uh, that, that has mass. Uh, but if you study light using other instruments, it looks like light is a wave that it doesn't have mass. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, a light is not, uh, I mean, sorry, a particle is not a wave and a wave is not a particle. And so even to this day, we have scientists saying that light is a mystery of two natures that work in a mysterious way. And so I I like appealing to that as a kind of analogy to say Mm -hmm. that simply because we can't understand how Jesus can be both God and man at the same time, that doesn't mean that he can't. That just means that he is beyond our capability of understanding. And we should rely on the authority of scripture, which affirms him being both at the same time and say, okay, God, I don't know how you can do this. It blows my mind to even think about it. (laughs) But because of the authority of scripture, because of what you say to us, I will trust you and I will believe it. And I will spend the rest of my life in eternity trying to understand it better, but I'm probably never uh, ever going to get there. Yeah. And in a way that's kind of wonderful because if we did figure it out, I I think we wouldn't be as awestruck by it. For sure. God is never ever going to be able to be placed in a box Mm -hmm. fully figured out fully systematized with all the doctrine no uh, i believe that he will be eternally beyond us and that's why we worship him amen well brian we really appreciate you coming on and explaining all this lending your expertise is your book going to be published are you wait Are you writing a book? Are you turning your dissertation into a book? Will we get to read it at some point? I would love to turn my dissertation into a book sometime. Uh, Those doors have not yet opened. Uh, As a uh, unpublished author who has written a lot, but nothing has been published, getting that first book to a publisher to have them take a risk on me, not knowing if I will sell any books. uh, Yeah, they haven't done taken that risk yet but lord willing uh that door will open and uh i would love to write lots of books on this subject awesome well i look forward to reading them so we have one more question for you today what difference does affirming yeshua's humanity and deity make in our everyday lives yeah great question and i'll i'll keep this one brief um Because of his humanity and his divinity, we can have comfort in two different ways. Because of his humanity, he is like us. 
He understands us. He's been there. He's suffered. He's, he's cried. He's, he's had times of disappointment. He is like us. And so we can have comfort in his humanity. But we can also have comfort in his divinity because he is not like us. He is far beyond us. He, he knows far beyond what we are able to comprehend. And so we can trust him. So he is like us in his humanity. He is not like us in his divinity. And yet we can rest in him because of both of his natures. The fact that Jesus is both human and God is a difficult concept to fathom, but it is also good news. Because he is God, Jesus can satisfy the Father's righteous requirements on our behalf. Because he is human, Jesus understands the challenges and temptations we face and intercedes for us. Indeed, only someone who is human and God could reconcile humans to God, and that someone is Jesus. We want to leave you with the words of Paul in Romans 9, verse 5, where he presents Jesus as the greatest way God has blessed the Jewish people. Paul wrote, From Israel is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or rate us on Spotify. Let us know how this podcast has moved you. We would also love if you can share it on social media with your friends and family. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Hope, featuring Brian Crawford. This episode was produced by Nicole Vaca and Grace Sweet, written by Rachel Larson, and edited by John Bautista. This episode was also created thanks to Dr. Mitch Glazer, Kyron Bautista, and Nathan Scherer. I'm Nicole Vaca. Until next time.